<clears throat> Jeremiah chapter 38, as we continue on, we have roughly uh, 13 or so chapters to go before we get done. We probably will be done, I'm hoping, by the end of July. And then um, I'm really praying about doing a study in the book of Revelation. And, and I think it's the appropriate time to do so with what's going on in the world today. Are we living in the last days? And so <clears throat> Jeremiah is preparing us for that here. You know, judgment is coming for the children of Judah. And, and he's basically saying, prepare yourselves. It's coming. And I think as Christians, we need to hear that from the word of the Lord, that judgment's coming and we need to prepare ourselves. There are going to be those who are going to be caught, cut off guard, right? Caught off guard. You know, they're not going to be prepared. They're not going to be ready. They're, they're going to think... You know, they've been saying this for a long time, and that's true. They have been saying it for a long time. Definitely true. <laughs> you just don't know if this is the time. And so that's why Paul encouraged us, encouraged us to be ready at all times, because you don't know. And, and it would be just like me for all of a sudden say, forget it, and then the Lord comes with, with my luck. I don't believe in luck, but just the way things sometimes happen, you know, and that's when it's going to happen. So we want to be ready at all times, and that's the message that uh, Jeremiah is giving to Israel and Judah here. A young man said, my father gave me some advice. This is what he said. If you keep running away from the things you're bad at, You'll never be good at anything except running. That's good advice, right? Don't keep running away from the things that you're not good at. You know, Work at it. Look at it from a different angle. Approach it from a different way and so forth. Good advice. And I think that when we hear good advice... We need to accept good advice, I, I think. And when I hear good advice, I think that it's good, and so I want to apply it to my life. And I'm specifically speaking of the Word of God here, but also those men, uh, women, who study the Word of God and have that relationship with the Lord who are blessed with wisdom and understanding. And when they give us good advice, we should probably listen, especially since they've been through it. And the Bible tells us to comfort one another with the comfort that God has comforted us with. And when you get someone like that giving you advice, then it would be wise to heed them. One, if they're giving you advice and warning you, I think that we need to take the warning because there's a possibility that you might be going down the wrong path, heading in the wrong direction, and end up in a pit. And you don't want to do that, and that's sad if that happens. So take the good advice and follow it. And Jeremiah is going to give some advice to Zedekiah. And basically the advice and what my theme is this evening is give up. Just give up. Now we don't like that word, especially as men, right? Don't give up. Keep going. I remember I was running a, a race at Mount Sac when I was in high school. I was doing a uh, invitational and never had... Uh, placed in an invitation of we've always gotten sixth seventh or eighth in cross country we'd have to run uh, two and a half miles at that time i think it's three now and, and i remember coming to the end and thinking that's it uh, i'm done I'm, I'm too far behind and then i remember a guy saying one guy and you got a medal and i thought to myself no way he goes yeah go get him and so i got so excited about the possibility of getting a medal. That I just started running faster and faster and I can see him getting closer and closer. I didn't want to give up. And so I gave it all that I could and I passed the guy up. I had the momentum, the speed that I actually could have passed the next guy up. But I gave up. I gave up right there. I was content with what I got. I was happy. And bring home a little medal to Virginia. She's my high school sweetheart. You know, the whole thing, be able to put it on my Leatherman's jacket that I didn't ever got, um, you know, <laughs> because I, I gave up. And Well, when I passed that finish line, it turned out the guy couldn't count. He was one short, <laughs> and so I still didn't get the medal. I should have passed that other guy. But we don't like giving up, right? Uh, we hate giving, especially as men. We're not going to give up. 
My, my brother, when we used to wrestle as kids, I would get on top of him. I'd sit my legs on his body and his chest, you know, and, and I'd have my hands right at his chest, and I'd start knocking on it like this. I go, you give up? He's like, no, I'm not giving up. And I'd keep knocking on his chest. You give up, you give up. You, no, I'm not giving up. I, I give, I give, I give. You know? Finally, he'd give up and I'd get off of him after hitting him a couple more times. We don't like giving up, but yet there's a time to give up, right? There's a time to say, I have no power, no strength, no will. I have no resources. I have no wisdom. I don't know what to do. And we just have to give it up to the Lord, we need to just trust in Him completely. That's when we know that we can trust Him to handle everything in our lives. When we can't handle it. See, if you have a plan, and if you can work your way through something, that's wonderful. God has given you great wisdom. But if there's no plan, and there's no way working around this situation, who do you give it to? Do you worry about it? Stay up late at night? get ulcers, stress out, that's when you give it up to the Lord and you let Him have it because you can't control the situation at all. You have to literally rely on Him completely. And we're going to see that here where Jeremiah is going to have to rely on God. They're going to literally lower him in a cistern uh, to die while this whole uh, famine is going on and this besieging from the Babylonians and they're giving him bread every day just to survive. We're going to see Jeremiah giving advice that the Babylonians are coming in. They are going to judge you. And if you don't give up, they will kill you. If you don't give in and just let them take you captives, let them take you to Babylon and somehow try to survive during this time, you will die. And so you need to give up, let them take you there, and survive because God has promised in 70 years he will restore you back to Jerusalem. And so it's a time of waiting upon the Lord. Trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so like them, like us, when we can't control our surroundings, we, we need to just trust in the Lord. So we come to verse 1. And we have a list of, of men here. Uh, basically some members there in in. Jerusalem, uh, saying, Now Jebatiah, the son of Matan, the Gadaliah, and the son of Pashur, Jukal, the son of Jebatiah, and Pashur, the son of Malchiah, heard the words that Jeremiah had spoken to all of the people. Now, and we see this throughout the, the whole book of Jeremiah, where he's basically warning them. The judgment is coming because of the idolatry. And, and, you know, just to get back to that a little bit, the, the nation of Israel pretty much had abandoned God completely. They were worshiping idols, even within the temple itself that was built for God. The Holy of Holies, they had idols erected inside the temple itself. Uh, that's crazy. That, that would be like us, to a certain degree, not as irreverent as they were, but us having a cross, and then in the corner, a Buddha, you know, guy with a fat belly, you know, sitting on a little stool and a bowl of rice so he can eat, you know, and then having on the other side another shrine, and then maybe even uh, the Virgin Mary over here with an altar and so forth, you know. That, that would seem silly, wouldn't it, to you? It, it would to me. It'd be strange. But that's basically what they were doing. And God said that was enough. Not only uh, were they in idolatry, but they weren't following God's commandments. Uh, they didn't let the land rest. And so he was going to allow the land to rest for that 70 years that he required. But we notice here that the people that Jeremiah was speaking to would not listen. Thus says the Lord, he who remains in this city shall die by the sword, by famine, by pestilence. And he who goes over to the Chaldeans shall live. His life shall be as a prize to him. And he shall live. And so there, there we go. Look, if you just give up, because in this city, people will die by the sword. They will die from hunger. They will die from disease. But those that go over with the Chaldeans who have given up, they're going to save their lives. And, and it would be like a gift to them. To be, wow, we at least are alive here, honey. 
You know, we might not have our children with us. Some may have died from hunger. Some may have died from pestilence. But we survived. It reminds us of the Holocaust in a sense. You know, where, where they just really tried to survive through that whole ordeal. Hiding themselves. You know, giving up of themselves. Going to the concentration camps. Some survived. Some died. You know, horrific time in a horrific place. The key to survival is to give in. In this case. You learn to fight another day. You don't always have to fight that day. We're living in a day and age where we may have to fight. We have the, the Jade Helms that's coming up this coming June. I think it's called the Jade Helms, something like that. It's a practice with uh, various parts of the military that's coming up and it's going to be for so long across nine different states. And they're going to be practicing on... How to protect our nation, I guess, is what they're telling us. We'll see. We have uh, the Jubilee coming up in October, which is a Jewish holiday. Uh, some are saying the end could start then. We have $19 trillion, if not more, in debt in this nation. We have a new person in office who's going to be stricter on gun tr control now and is literally going to run with it as much as she can and we're living in a time where we may have to take up arms or do we give up that's the question right some are going to give up some are going to just sit back and say take me they're going to open up the doors they're going to come in and, and pretty much take you and they're already doing it now they literally will come into houses and they will confiscate everything that you have as far as firearms ammunition and so forth and some may just give up and let them do so others may fight now, we saw the whole standoff, right, in Texas there with, with some of the military and then also the uh, police force there trying to, uh, I, I can't remember the whole story um, of the land there that they said it was theirs. And they said, no, this is our land, and they were fighting over that. Uh, so we're seeing some of this stuff taking place. Others are going to fight. Others are going to give up. But is now the time to fight or is now the time to give up? I, I'm not suggesting one or the other. I have no idea. I know some are preparing uh, in great ways. I mean, I'm talking about not just guns and ammunition, but hideouts and, and foods and rations and various things like that. Others are just saying it's never going to happen. I'm just going to wait and see what happens. And when it happens, we'll see where things go. I'm kind of like, okay, I'm trusting in God. Is there that possibility? Yes, of course there's always that possibility. Christians have been persecuted throughout history. What makes us think we're not going to get persecuted? They're being persecuted right now. Seed is still in Iranian prison. Uh, they go, they're going from town to town and they're taking over these little Christian towns and they're killing all the men and all the children and keeping all the beautiful little girls so they can sell them off. That's happening right now. So do we fight or do we wait for another day? You know, I don't know. I don't know. I still yet haven't bought a gun. I, I have the resources to buy a gun. I've gotten gift cards enough to buy a couple of guns now, and I just haven't done it. I don't know why. I'm just praying and seeking the Lord, and, and I, sometimes I take a step towards it, then I just kind of back off because I'm not sure. You know, I know my sons are probably more sure than I am what they're going to do. You know, I'm probably going to go run and hide with them. <laughs> or go wherever Virginia goes. Virginia's crazy. She's just like, let's, let's, let's dig a fort. You know? <laughs> Where are we going to put it? We, we just don't know. But when the odds are against you, uh, like that, sometimes just giving up is, is the key. And when you give up in this circumstance with our government and so forth, then you have to have the strength to endure whatever punishment, whatever crime, whatever may happen to you by the government. But never deny the Lord Jesus Christ. Never deny the Lord Jesus Christ. In that, you never give up. You always trust in Him, and you never deny Him at all. My, son, my grandson just uh, graduated uh, junior high, and I wrote in his card, uh, I just kind of felt, to write this and says you, you you know in, in a sense you're you're now growing up and you're gonna be challenged 
in, in this whole new venture of yours, in a, in a sense, I said, I can't remember exactly what I wrote, but I, I basically told him this, that you're going to make new friends, and these friends are going to try to sway you in another direction, and you can't let them. You can't believe them, and you can't believe the lies that will be told to you. You're going to have to change, and you're going to have to grow up, in a sense. Don't ever give up. Don't ever deny him. Don't go off and say, well, I'll deny him right now and then, you know, I'll confess it later. You don't know if there will be a later. You know, that's the struggle that we're all going to have to endure. It could be and it could be not. And I don't want to cause you to fear at, at the same time because God is in control and he's able to give his people strength and power. He's able to protect them supernaturally and he's also able to snatch them away if he wants to into his presence. But they were to give up. They were to give in. They were to go along and, and their lives would be as a gift from God. Just get through it, survive, and I'll get you back to the land. In a sense, if we do die... If we do go through something, God is going to restore us anyway, right? I mean, these bodies are temporal anyway. They're decaying and dying, diminishing. They're in constant pain and suffering. And if the Lord takes us, then what are we, what are we waiting for in the future? We're waiting for a new body. We're waiting for a new Jerusalem, a new heaven, a new earth. Because our soul never dies, but it will stand before God. And so, in a sense... The same is true with us. God is going to restore us completely. So we don't have to fear at all these things. He goes on in verse 3, Thus says the Lord, This city shall surely be given into the hands of the king of Babylon's army, which shall take it. So that's a definite. They keep trying to persuade Jeremiah to say something different. They keep hoping God would change his mind, but he's not. Judgment is coming. Now, Jeremiah's en enemies are going to complain to Zedekiah the king, who then is going to give them the permission to uh, mistreat him. Now, this is all political, right? Now, this is political. You have Zedekiah, who's the king. You have cabinet members. You have people that are running the, running the nation and so forth. And so uh, the power struggles that are going on at that time. And so Zedekiah, who, who really, really is on the side of Jeremiah but doesn't want to show it, so we're going to see later on that secretly he's going to call, it, call him in. But yeah, you have these guys who just hate Jeremiah. And they go to Zedekiah and says, we need to do something. And he goes, yeah, yeah, we need to do something. Go ahead and do what you, you need to do at the same time. That's politics. Politics is where, where someone basically just tells you what you want to hear. That's when you know it's politics. When, when, when they're um, flattering you. You know, you know what flattery is, right? They're telling you how good you are and patting you on the back and you're wonderful. Everything's going to be... And you're like, stop flattering me. I just want to hear the truth. People don't like politics. I, I hear that so often with churches. Oh, there's too, many, too much politics in church. I'm like, okay, so how is there politics in church? Because I don't see that. I don't see there being politics in church. There shouldn't be politics in church. I don't know where they get that from. I'd like to hear some of those stories as to how they get their politics in church. I remember the church I went to, and they were, it was politics in church. Really? So people are like running for office or, or what? You know, positions? I can see that now. Ministries fighting with each other for position, for money, for resources, for people, for status, that type of things. I don't necessarily believe that's politics, though they're positioning themselves for places and so forth. That's more flesh than anything else. Yeah. But we shouldn't be playing politics. We should be honest people, sincere people, and, and let our motives be heard very clearly. He goes on now, as these men are, are angry at Jeremiah, Therefore the princes have said to the king, Please let this man be put to death. I mean, that's their heart. Let's kill him. Just like the Pharisees said of Jesus. For thus he weakens the hands of the men of war. In other words... He's discouraging them. He's discouraging them by his words. By him telling the truth that, that, that destruction is coming and, and God's a part of this, he's weakening their hands. And so that's the reason that um, they want to kill him. 
men of war who remain in this city in the hands of all the people by speaking such words to them. For this man does not seek the welfare of this people, but their harm. Isn't that interesting? Their observation of why he's doing that, right? This guy doesn't care about us. He's giving us this bad news. He doesn't care about the people. He's not encouraging the, the generals and the commanders and the army to get ready because we can beat these guys. He's discouraging us. He needs to be killed. But that's not the case, is it? It's so interesting how people have a perspective of what's going on without knowing what's going on. They can always jump to their conclusions, surmise, have their ideas, but in reality, they have no idea what is really going on. Uh, that, that's one of the things that I just get so tired of in ministry, is people being able to read hearts. Like, you have no idea what's going on in that situation. Why don't you stop, as Paul said, being a busybody and just get to work with the Lord? Knock it off. As more important things to do than you trying to figure out what's really going on in there. Stop it. Let God figure that out. Don't be a busybody because more than likely, you're wrong. I don't know how many times I've thought that I knew what was going on. And so I always approach them and I say, hey, tell me if I'm wrong, but this is what I'm getting. And they go, oh, you're wrong. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, good. I'm glad I'm wrong. Wonderful. Let's move on. Let's go from there. Because I don't want to assume anything. I just want to know what's going on when I, I confront someone, so I'm honest with them. This is what I think, but I'm probably wrong, so you tell me. You tell me exactly. And that's the way to approach it. But don't, uh, don't guess. Uh, in reality, the truth is, and we know here, that, that, Jer- that uh, Jeremiah does love the people. And he's giving them a wonderful message of grace and mercy. The guy is saying, just give up. Just give in, and your life will be a prize to you. Then Zedekiah the king, verse 5, said, Look, he is in your hand, for the king can do nothing against you. So there's the politics, right? Whatever you you want to do, go ahead and and take them. Uh, These guys definitely had some influence on the king. So Jeremiah is lowered into this uh, cistern where he sinks in the mud there. Uh, Now you know what a cistern is. They would dig out a a big hole in the ground. Especially in the cities, uh, there was not running water, so they dig big, a dig, big, I mean big hole. Take this building, because I was in a cistern in, in uh, Israel, and it was probably the size of this room, but round, and then add another top to it. That's how big the cisterns are. And they would create stairs along the side of it, so that when it's lowered, you'd walk down the stair and you can get your water out that way. This cistern was dry because they don't need cisterns anymore. And so there was a lot of pigeon holes and pigeons in this cistern. So they throw him in this thing, which is in a, a, a odd kind of a, a vase shape. So it's round at the bottom and then comes up. So there's no way out. And there's still some water down there and he's sinking in the mud. So basically he's going to die. So they took Jeremiah, cast him into the dungeon of uh, Malachiah, the king's son, which was in the court of the prison. And they let Jeremiah down with ropes. And in the dungeon there was no water but mire. So Jeremiah sank in the mire. So they had to let him down with ropes because there was no way for him to get down or to get out. So he's pretty much stuck there. Now, interesting here. Jeremiah was a man being punished for doing the will of God. Uh, we saw that in the Beatitudes, right? The uh, last two in chapters uh, 11 and 12 about being persecuted for righteous sake. And here's Jeremiah telling the truth and yet they're persecuting him uh, because he's doing what God told him to do. He's doing the right thing. That's a good place to be, by the way. If you're doing the right thing and they're persecuting you, then that's good. If they're laughing at you, at you that's good. So be encouraged if that happens, if you're doing good. But it's interesting that they hurt God's messengers, right? They always hurt God's messengers because they can't hurt God. They can't go up to God and punish Him and say, God, you're a bad God and you shouldn't be doing this. And, you know, so here's your punishment. They can't do that because He's God. And so what do they do? They get the messenger. 
and his messenger, and they try to punish him. Turn to Matthew chapter 21. Let me just talk about this for a second here. And we'll probably hit it once we get to chapter 21 on Sunday mornings if we ever get there. Verse 33. Uh, it's a parable. Throughout history, we have had martyrs for the cause of Christ who have given up their lives for their faith. And they are the ones that are being persecuted and punished for the truth of God, for God's message, God's truth. Jesus gives a parable, verse 33, here another parable. There was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a tower. And he leased it to vine dressers and went into a far country. So there's your picture, right? A, a, a guy who owns this land. He, he then gets somebody to tend the land, take care of it. He's paying them to tend it. It's not theirs. It, it, it's been given to them uh, to take care of it, and he's going to pay them for taking care of it, but yet, yet they're going to feel that it is theirs, and it's theirs by right. Now, when, the, when vintage time drew near, he sent his servants to the vine dressers that they might receive its fruit. And the vine dressers took his servants, beat one, killed one, and stoned another. So he sends his servants to, you know, hey, this is my land. I'm planting some fruit there. You guys are tending it. I'd like to see some fruit. And they take the guys and beat them up. <laughs> Just whip them. So what are you doing taking our fruit? No, it's not yours. It's, it's our owner's. It's his. So why are you beating us? Why don't you go beat the owner? No, they're beating them. They're stoning them. Again, he sent another servant more than the first, and they did likewise to them. Then last of all, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the vinedress saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. See the trickery in their mind? You know, there's conniving oh the son is here not just the servants he sent the son this is the descendant this is the one that's going to inherit all this boy we kill him we get the land i mean they're thinking in the future they got a five twenty year plan going here you know, let, let's let's kill this guy and, and when the owner dies we're the ones tending it you know grandfather claus we get it that's what they're thinking uh evil wicked men who are thinking evil plans and so they take the son and they want to kill him in a in a you know in the truth and so it says in verse what word i uh, 38 but when the vine saw the son they came come let us kill him season inheritance they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him therefore when the owner of the vineyard comes what will he do to those vine dressers now this is jesus speaking to them what is he going to do? And they said to him, He will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to another vine dresser who will render to him the fruit in their seasons. What's the key of this, um, this parable? Is it about those that tend the land? No. Is it about him owning the land? No. It's about those servants that he has sent. And ultimately, it's about his son that he sends. And they kill and crucify and he dies on the cross but judgment is coming and that judgment is sure to come and that's why we need to be those servants who are preaching the message and not worried about those who are persecuting the messengers god will have his day oh and it seems so unfair that they are getting away with it but they're not getting away with it they will stand before god one day you can turn back to jeremiah 38 and so be faithful to preach the message. Be strong, even though they're persecuting you. But Jeremiah is rescued, uh, God's grace. He's rescued from the cistern by actually Zedekiah, who sends a non-Israelite Ethiopian eunuch to help him. Verse 7, now ebed Melech, the Ethiopian, one of the eunuchs who was in the king's house, heard that they had put Jeremiah in a dungeon. When the king was sitting at the gate of Benjamin, <clears throat> Ebed-Melech, 
went out of the king's house and spoke to the king, saying, My lord, the king, these men have done evil in all that they have done to Jeremiah the prophet, whom they have cast into the dungeon, and he is likely to die from hunger in the place where he is. For there is no more bread in the city. Then the king commanded Ebed, Melech the Ethiopian, saying, Take from here thirty men with you, and lift Jeremiah the prophet out of the dungeon before he dies. So Ebed Melech took the men with him and went into the house of the kings under the treasury, took from their old clothes and old rags, and let uh, them down by the ropes into the dungeon to Jeremiah. Uh, then Ebed uh, Melech the Ethiopian said to Jeremiah, Please put uh, these clothes, old clothes and rags under your armpits, under the rope. And Jeremiah did so. Uh, why? Because, you know, the rope being under his rope is going to rub and probably going to, you know, scrape him or cut him. So it gets to make him a little more comfortable. They could uh, lift him out of the pit more comfortably. So they throw the rope down with the rags. He's to put it all around his pits and then uh, bring himself up. That makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, that's practical sense right there. I mean, that's something that we would do. I know when I go work out, uh, I do this one exercise with the legs where I have the, a strap on my leg and I'm, I'm doing this with the weight. Well, what I do is I put a towel around my foot and then I put the strap on because it's just easier that way. You know, I love the Bible. It's so practical. I mean, if it was not true, why would it mention something so simple like that? I mean, because it's true. It's just simple things in the word like this that, that makes me know and understand that it is the word of God because God is a practical God. I mean, that's little, that might be a little thing for you, but for me, that's a big thing, just reading something like that. Because you can almost see it happening. This is a historical situation that is taking place. And people will say, oh, the Old Testament, we don't even know it's true. It's all metaphor. Yeah, really? Knucklehead. So they pulled Jeremiah up with ropes and lifted him out of the dungeon. And Jeremiah remained in the court of the prison. <clears throat> uh, the only way out of this worldly pit is God's rope of grace, isn't it? The only way for the world to survive is God's grace to be revealed to them. The only way for us when we're in a pit is to reach up to God's grace and mercy. It's the only way to get out of a pit. You ever feel like you're in a pit? You know, things aren't going right. There's a struggle. Uh, things are happening. Why am I in this pit? I can't get out of this pit, Lord. And God says there's grace. There's grace for you. There's a, it's waiting for you. I read this one commentary and it says this, the believer who seeks to live the Christian life through self-effort is like the man who, in attempting to sail across the Atlantic Ocean, found his boat becalmed for days. In other words, his boat was just still. There's no wind, there's no waves. He found himself just still, not moving at all. Finally, Frustrated by, the, by his lack of progress, he tried to make his stalled boat move by pushing against the mass. Though strenuous efforts, he succeeded in making the boat rock and so created a few small waves on the otherwise smooth sea. Seeing the waves and feeling the rocking of the boat, he assumed that he was making progress. And so continued his efforts. Of course, although he exerted himself a great deal, he actually got nowhere. You see the picture? <laughs> He's like moving it back and forth, and it's not really going anywhere. A lot of work. And he says, so is the Christian life. The source of the Christian strength lies in God's grace, not in exer exertions of willpower or in efforts of discipline or any other self effort now understand this because this is interesting what he's saying here is, is it's not what we can do it's not how we work at it it's not how we manipulate it it's how we just live with it through God's grace what would have been the proper response from this man to seek God and wait upon the Lord to bring a wave a win whatever it was that would have been the proper response. Not to sit there and try to move the boat and waste all that energy and water and food and then die. 
You know, but to say, Lord, I know that you are powerful. You created the waves. You created the sea. There's nothing that you can do. If you divided it, you can send wind. And so I'm going to wait here until you do that. See, that's grace. It's not your work. You're saying, Lord, it's your work, and so I'm expecting you to do something. That's true grace. And so when we find ourselves in a pit or just in our daily walking with the Lord, we need to walk by grace. It's all in God's hands. He is in control. I can think of many stories right now in my head where we try to take control of things. Anger is one evidence of trying to take control, right? You, you can't control the situation, so what do you do? You get angry. You get frustrated. You grab it and you scream and yell. Yet it's, nothing's changed. <laughs> you know, nothing's changed. He hasn't changed for years. Why do you think he's going to change now? No, it's grace. Now, personally speaking, I know that to be true. That God's grace and my wife's grace on my life has changed me tremendously. Because I was that man that would just get so mad and yet I wouldn't change anything. I'd get upset. I remember having to take my mom uh, to work because my mom has never drove. And yet she has worked uh, pretty much all her life. So she's taken buses. She'll take taxis. she'll, She'll find a way to get there. And, and and when we were in high school, she'd ask us to come pick her up because we, we drove. I would get so frustrated. I'd have to go all the way out money, then all the way back, right at 2.30, 3 o'clock, right when all the traffic, right when I should be doing my homework like a good little boy. <laughs> I'm out there picking my mom, and I would get so mad, and she'd get mad at me, and the whole time we'd be mad at each other. Going backwards, I'm never asking you again. Please don't ask me again. You know, going back and forth. You know, and I think back at that, and I'm like, man, did I miss opportunities to just sit and talk with my mom and enjoy that time. Instead of getting so frustrated because I didn't want to do it. And I tried to control it with my anger. It, it doesn't work. And I've done that in my relationship with my wife, but her grace and God's grace has, has always convicted me. You know, and, and I have tried to change more and more and God is still working in my heart that was one area that that the Lord continues to work because I just get frustrated I I was just uh, we just went away for a couple of days to enjoy ourselves and and we were really looking forward to this because just really tired and so we went to Balboa and we reserved this one room that I have it on my phone and everything and when we get there we're excited we're walking up the stairs we're ready to make a left and the guy makes a right and we're like wait where are you going and he makes a right opens the door goes, this isn't the room we asked for he goes well well but it's the room that they told me this is the keys that go there I'm like okay but it's not the room look look i'll show you on the phone it's the only room so he calls down there and says well that guy um did a what do they call it a a stay over where they stayed another night and i go oh that's why so now i'm mad and I'm thinking, Lord, this isn't the way to start off. We're supposed to relax. And I just couldn't get over it. And, and Virginia, her grace is there. She doesn't get on me. She just loves me. She just watches me. She laughs probably. You know, and I, she just waits, probably praying in, under her breath as she does so often. And finally, I just uh, called him and says, I'm really upset. <laughs> well, we're glad you told us. We'll put you in another room. And they put us in a better room than what we even wanted. And so it took me four hours to get over that. Isn't that crazy? That is crazy. And I know ladies are going, yes. (laughs) That is, I I agree with you. And I wish I could control that. But see, it's not my efforts. It's not my work. I'm sitting there rocking that boat as much as I can. And it ain't going nowhere. (laughs) You know, and so what do I do? Tell me what to do. I just take it to the Lord and say, Lord, you've got to take these feelings. You've got to take this frustration. You need to take these things away from me. And so I wait for the next one to see how I do. You know? and, and hopefully as I continue to go through those things, I get better and better and better, which I think I've gotten somewhat better. On a scale of, of 1 to 10, I'm, I'm at least an 8 maybe. No, maybe a 6. 6? Is that too low, babe? <laughs> Somewhere around there. So, uh, again, the whole point of this thing is, is that we need to live in God's grace. See, the thing that I should have done was, okay, we'll just take this room and accept it. 
that is so hard for a man to do, to give in, right? It is so hard. Where I'm sure Virginia was like, I like this room. Ah, okay. Live in God's grace. Live right there where, where he's in control. And, and you know, he has you in his hands and there's a purpose for it all. I mean, he, there was lessons there for me and I probably missed them. I'll be honest with you. <laughs> I miss a lot of lessons. So, live in his grace. John 1, 16 and 17 says, For from this fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. I, I don't think Jesus would be concerned about a room. I don't think Jesus would get, get angry except to see his house being used as a merchandise to make money for thieves and robbers. No, he would have grace. <clears throat> the Lord God is merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. Exodus 34, 6. Therefore, grace is almost always associated with mercy, love, compassion, and patience. Having mercy, having love, having compassion, and definitely having patience, waiting on the Lord. We, we walk in his grace. So Jeremiah graciously waited uh, for the Lord, and, and God's grace came and saved him. <clears throat> and come to verse 14. Then Zedekiah, king, sent and had Jeremiah the prophet brought to him at the third entrance of the house of the Lord. So probably one of the gates there in Jerusalem. We don't know which, uh, which gate. And the king said to Jeremiah, I will ask you something. Hide nothing from me. Here we go again. Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, If I declare it to you, you will not surely put me to you will will you sure, you will you not surely put me to death? And if I give you advice, you will not listen to me. So uh, he's been here before, right? Look, it, I'm going to tell you again, but if I tell you, don't put me to death. You know, but you're not going to listen. So Zedekiah the king swore secretly to Jeremiah, saying, As the Lord lives, who made our very souls, I will not put you to death, nor will I give you into the hand of these men who seek your life. So Jeremiah says uh, to Zedekiah, Thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, uh, If you surely surrender to the king of Babylon's princes, then your soul shall live. This city shall be or shall not be burned with fire and you and your house shall live. But if you do not surrender to the king of Babylon's princes, then this city shall be given into the hands of the Chaldeans. They shall burn it with fire and you shall not escape from their hand. And Zedekiah the king said to Jeremiah, I am afraid of the Jews who have defected to the Chaldeans, lest they deliver me into their hands and they abuse me. What is he saying there? He says, I can't give in, right? Because I'm afraid of the Jews. If I give in and I go over there, then those Jews are going to rat on me and then they're going to take me and they'll kill me. And so he's kind of caught in a bad place. And so he's worried there. He's not trusting in God. But Jeremiah said, they shall not deliver you. Please obey the voice of the Lord, which I speak to you. So it shall be well with you, and your soul shall live. So encouraging the king here, look, I know that you don't see the future, but God does. I know you don't understand faith and grace, but I'm telling you, if you give in, trust in God, you'll live. We make decisions sometimes based upon what we think will happen, right? How many times do we do that? We do it quite often. Oh, no, we can't go down there because this might happen. Oh, I can't go that way because you never know. I can't invest in that because, ooh, something might be wrong. But we don't know. We don't know. And sometimes it hinders us. Sometimes it cripples us because we don't take steps of faith. Ministry is kind of like that where we don't stretch ourselves because we're too worried. Well, if I go too much, then how are we going to do it? This whole Summerfest thing was, was a venture of faith last year. Man, it was impossible in my eyes. I just couldn't see it. And it was someone else's suggestion, 
And everybody else was like, let's go for it. I'm like, you guys all have jobs. You know, I, I work in the church. What do you mean, let's go? I'm like, wait a minute. And I couldn't see it. And I'm like, okay, Lord, I'm going to trust in you, though. And it was a big event for 11 weeks straight with this tiny church. Of course, we had help from Refuge and from Eastvale. And that was great to have that help there to cushion it to a certain degree. But it was amazing when God took us through it. I still can't believe that we were able to do it. Sometimes we need to take those steps of faith, trusting God that he's going to do a great work, even as scary as it may look. Trust in him. But don't let it kill you because this decision of Zedekiah killed him and his sons because he didn't give in. They'll not deliver you. Just obey the voice of the Lord. Now think about this for a second. It's, it's amazing how people reject God's truth. And that just blows me away. It's amazing that Christians reject God's truth. That blows me away even more. When you've served with them so long and then you come up and you say, look at what the word says. And I'm like, ah. Not right now. I'm really enjoying this. No, I don't want that. And I I don't understand how they can just reject God's work and walk away. And then be so apologetic too about it. Oh, I'm really sorry, but they're you know enjoying what they're doing. You know, it's shameful. It's wrong. I, I would be embarrassed, ashamed to reject God's word and truth. I mean, you can plead with them, you can beg them. Um, I've done that so many times with with people. Begged them and pleaded with them and tell them they're going down the wrong path, what they're going to miss, I mean, what God was doing, and they just reject it completely. You warn them of what's coming, uh, the change, the judgment, whatever it is, and they just continue to say, I don't care, I don't care, and they reject it. That's a hard place to be for someone who's sharing the truth, but also for the person that's not. Because can you imagine the conviction, the conviction that's going on there in their lives? Just even recently, uh, there's an, there was someone here in the church and decided not to come anymore. And, and um, just really trying to minister to them and not listening. And it's funny because just the other day they posted something and some secular friend said, hey, whatever happens to whosoever's, so he's already going down secular stuff. And the world is now convicting him. You know, that's sad. Completely sad to be in that place. We warn and we share God's truth because we love you. We care about you. This world has nothing to offer you but death. The wages of sin is death. It's death. And it's going to lead you down that path. You've got to see that. You can't ever give up, no matter what you hunger for, no matter what you desire. Keep Christ in the center of your life at all times. You never know. And that's why I told my grandson, I said, no matter what friends you make, don't believe their lies. <laughs> don't believe their lies. Don't believe the lies of the teachers that you're going to have. Believe the Word of God and keep Him centered. If, it doesn't, if He doesn't, He will find Himself... Well, truly stuck. And, and King Zedekiah did. <clears throat> and Jeremiah knows how he feels. Look at verse 21. But if you refuse to surrender, this is the word that the Lord has shown me. So this is what the Lord said. Now behold, all the women who are left in the kings of Judah's house shall be surrounded sur- or surrendered to the king of Babylon's princesses. And these women shall say, your close friends have set upon you and prevailed against you. Your feet have sunk in the miry, and they have turned away again. So they shall surrender all your wives, your children to the Chaldeans. You shall not escape from their hand, but, but shall be taken by the hand of the king of Babylon. And you shall cause this city to be burned with fire. Then Zedekiah said to Jeremiah, 
Let no one know of these words, and you shall not die. So again, <clears throat> telling the truth is going to kill you, Jeremiah. But if the princes hear that I have talked with you, and they come to you and say to you, declare to us now what you have said to the king, and also what the king said to you, do not hide it from us, and we will not put you to death. Then you shall say to them, I presented my request before the king that he should make or not make me return to Jonathan's house to die there. And, and so this is what Zedekiah is telling Jeremiah to, to say. Now this happened before. He's not telling him to lie. Because if you remember back in, I think, 37, Jeremiah actually came to Zedekiah and says, Hey, can you take me out of this house? I don't want to be in this house anymore. Otherwise I die. So Zedekiah is just rephrasing what he said and say hey just tell him that you came to me and, and asked me to take you out of that house otherwise you will die because they'll take you again that political thing that's going on and all the princes came to jeremiah and asked him and he told them according to all these words that the king had commanded so they stopped speaking with him for the conversation had not been heard now jeremiah remained in the court of the prison until the day that jerusalem was taken and he was there when Jerusalem was taken so Jeremiah survived but he's going to continue on in chapter 39 as we uh, continue to look at this uh, <clears throat> this besieging there on Jerusalem so time to give up and a time to fight <clears throat> that's the time to pray and to seek the Lord live in his grace and his mercies and even in persecution we can find grace there to survive to move on let's pray gracious father we thank you lord for your word for this young man jeremiah lord who endured a lot for the truth for men like a seed who are enduring a lot for not denying his faith lord for these men and women fathers and mothers lord and and little girls lord who are enduring horrific things Lord we can't even imagine them from these wicked evil men Lord God because they love you Lord and they won't deny you may you have grace on them at this time Lord may you give them the strength that they need to continue on Father may you see their blood speaking out to you Lord May you deal with these terrorist groups, Lord. Somehow, Father, work out your plan, Lord, for your glory, Lord. If this is signs of the end, Lord, wake up your church. Let them see that judgment is coming. Even in America, Father, the judgment that is coming against this world and is beginning with the persecution against the church, Lord. As we saw just in the news, another Methodist group just gave in and, uh, into the same-sex marriage, Lord. It's now okay for them. Uh, Bruce Jenner, who, who just did a complete transformation, Lord, to a woman. These are all things and signs, Lord, of the end. We're living in crazy, mixed-up days, Lord. We don't even know what's up or down, what's right or wrong anymore, Lord. People are so confused. We pray, Lord, that you'd give us strength because we have the truth. And we need to give out this truth, even if they reject it, Lord. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Give us strength and power and boldness, Lord. During those times where we're weak and scared and timid to share, Lord, the truth that you've given to us. You've entrusted us with the gospel message, Lord. And we pray these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.